I've always been fascinated with building computers. I mean, heck, even this video you're watching right now was edited on a computer I built. <laughs> but that sentence isn't nearly as impressive as it would have been 20 years ago. These days, even that kid Hayden that lives down the block from you can build a computer from Newegg, many orders of magnitude stronger than the computer that first sent man to the moon. And he's just gonna use it to post hateful comments about you on the neighborhood subreddit. These days, the type of computer building that really interests me are when people build working computers inside of programs that are themselves already being computed. For example, here's a version of Minecraft being run on a simulated computer within Minecraft using only redstone. Here's a computer performing addition inside of Tears of the Kingdom using only light to move data. Now it's that last one alongside a wonderful video by Physics for the Birds that got me interested in how I could build a working computer inside of Pokemon. Across all of the mainline Pokemon games, there exist countless examples of interactable NPCs, dialogue options, switches, buttons. I mean, hell, even battles themselves are intricate simulations. Surely within all of these things exists a recipe to build a working computer inside of Pokemon, right? Well, let's find out. Oh no, Hayden just posted that you think Trash Day is Tuesday instead of Wednesday and that you are, and these are his words, not mine, a dumb, dumb, stupid poo-poo head. Yikes. Oh, it has 40 upvotes too. I don't think you should respond. First of all, what even is a computer? I mean, it's something that computes, right? But what does that mean? Like, you know, we all agree that this is a computer and this is definitely a computer, but what about this? Is this a computer? Well, it computes, so yeah. But okay, what about this? Is this a computer? And yeah, okay, I own an abacus, but not a calculator. That's normal, right? That's a normal, that's not normal? That's not, okay, well, whatever, that's fine. I'm, I'm an abacus is a calculation device. It definitely helps you keep track of numbers when you're counting or doing addition, but you still have to manipulate all of the beads during the calculation yourself. A computer is able to do things autonomously. So in that sense, maybe we need to move one order of magnitude back up to the calculator. A calculator takes user input and then autonomously computes an output. I think that has to be our definition of a computer. But how do we construct something like this inside of Pokemon? I mean, at the end of the day, it's a children's video game. And I wanna leverage only assets that already exist in the game. That's a key part of this challenge. If I let myself use a bunch of custom code and custom objects, this really wouldn't be that hard. But I wanna use things that only exist in the game already. But before we can figure out what Pokemon mechanics will best suit making a computer, we need to understand how the basic building blocks of a computer even work. And for that, we need to talk about logic gates. Electricity can really only be in two states, on or off, right? How does a computer take that binary signal of electricity just being on or off and transform it into something useful? Well, through very creative circuitry, you can do almost anything. Let's take a look at a specific logic gate, the AND gate. Every gate has a specific shape to denote which one it is without using words, the same way that we have different symbols for different operations in mathematics. An AND gate takes two signals as inputs and returns one output. To better see what this gate is doing, we're gonna use this super handy thing called a truth table. A truth table is just a really nice way to lay out what happens when you do different variations on our inputs. Since we have two inputs and both can be on or off, we have four variations. When both signals are off, the gate returns false. When either of the signals is on, but the other is off, the gate also returns false. But when both signals are on or true, the gate returns true. Hopefully now you can see why it's called an AND gate. The next important gate is an OR gate. An OR gate returns true if one input OR the other is on. There's also the NOT gate, which just takes one input and inverts it. And from these gates alone, the AND, the OR, and the NOT, you can build all logic circuitry. There exist shorthand gates out there that are just common combinations of the other gates and thus warrant their own symbol. For example, the exclusive OR gate, which is abbreviated XOR. This is a gate that only returns true if one or the other input is true, but not when both are true. There's also NAND, NOR, and exclusive NOR. In order to get my bearings when starting this project, I decided that the smartest thing would be to try to simulate each individual logic gate first and then go from there. If I can make every single gate and chain them together, then theoretically I could make something that is Turing complete. Turing completion is a concept in computer science. 
A machine is considered Turing complete, basically, if it can perform any computing task or algorithm. If I'm able to create every logic gate in Pokemon and chain them together to perform some computation tasks, then in theory, all that's separating me from having a Turing machine and thus any computer or computing any program inside of Pokemon is the limit of my imagination and or the limit of the cartridge's memory. The simplest important computation task done by combining logic gates together is addition. Since logic circuitry is already handling values of only one or zero, we need to learn how to add two binary numbers together. But how do we do that? How is it different than adding two numbers together in our base 10 system? Adding together two binary numbers is super simple. 0 plus 0 is 0, 1 plus 0 is 1, but 1 plus 1 is where things get interesting. It works just like how it does in base 10 when you try to add two numbers together that result in a sum greater than 9. So like in base 10, when you add 5 plus 5, you get 0 and then a carried 1, meaning 1, 0, or 10. In binary, it works the same way. 1 plus 1 is 0 with a carried 1, meaning 1, 0, which is equal to 2. The simplest form of addition within logic circuitry is the addition of two single-digit binary numbers. To do this, we use a circuit called a half adder. A half adder is constructed by combining an XOR and an AND gate. The reason it's called a half adder, which kind of just sounds like some sort of weird messed up snake, is because if you've already performed some kind of binary addition and want to feed that input into the half adder, it can't do anything about a carry digit that comes along. It only takes two inputs, not three. So it might not come as a surprise then that if you cleverly combine two half adders and a little extra circuitry, you can make a full adder, which sounds like a slightly less messed up snake. This means that if you have two numbers to add and a carry digit from the last place of addition, the full adder can handle it. Combining full adders together gives you the ability to add numbers with more digits. For example, four full adders together allows you to add two four digit binary numbers together, both of which can have a maximum value of 15, meaning you can add up to 30. This is called a four bit adder. I want to construct a four bit adder within Pokemon. First, I wanna make a half adder, then I would love to wind up at a four bit full adder. And from there, the sky's the limit. With an infinite amount of computation time, you could just link logic gates together forever and ever inside of Pokemon and you could compute anything. But I'm getting ahead of myself. We don't even know what we're gonna use yet. There are lots of things in the various Pokemon games that act independently like logic gates do. For example, in Lieutenant Surge's gym, there's the infamous trash can puzzle. There are two trash cans that contain one switch each. Neglecting the randomness of the positioning of the switches, if you flick both switches on, the electrical gate guarding the gym leader opens. Aside from being literally the worst puzzle ever, and frankly not a puzzle, this is very definitely an AND gate. When searching for logic gates inside of Pokemon, you can even think more abstractly. Like for example, getting all eight gym badges to open access to the Elite Four is kind of like an eight-way AND gate. Or what about requiring a soft drink to get past the guards in the Kanto region? That's sort of like an OR gate, right? You only have to take it past one of them. That being said, after poring over my options, I was able to figure out what I wanted to use. I knew of a special tile in Generation 3 that could be configured using a switch. In Pokemon Ruby and Sapphire, in Tate and Liza's gym, there are these treadmill tiles. The white ones cannot be changed, but the red ones can. Pressing a switch causes a corresponding red tile to change to a different direction. If I represent one switch as our A input, and another switch that changes a different tile as our B input, and then have those changing tiles send us down one of two paths, one which represents an output of zero, and one as an output of one, I should be able to build a logic gate. So I got to tinkering. I have a little bit of ROM hacking experience from my youth because I had a very normal childhood, thank you for asking, with very normal friends who did very normal stuff, and I did normal things as well. Normal stuff, I'm a normal guy. However, I very quickly realized that this wasn't just gonna be about moving the red tiles around on the map. I was also gonna have to relearn a skill I hadn't used since I was 12, and even then I was never really very good at it. Scripting in Gen 3's native scripting language. The way these switches work is that they have a script tied to them that points to a specific tile to change when you flip the switch. It points to the tile in XY coordinates and tells that tile what to change to. So if I move a red treadmill tile, the switch is now just gonna update the spot where the tile used to be. So all that being said, I'm not gonna be using scripting to write any custom code per se. I just need to tell each switch in our logic gate what tile to point to, and then what tile to change it into. Then I can have it update even more than one tile. 
After all, it already has to update not just the red treadmill tile to a different direction, but the switch also has to update its own tile to the switch where the lever is in a different position. So since the scripts can already handle two tiles, what's stopping me from being able to update it to not just do those, but also affect more red tiles all at once? So I got to work. I spent time learning and relearning how to script, and then had to learn how the game store's memory addresses so that I didn't point to anything stupid and already necessary. It took a good amount of work and research, but eventually after some tests, and thankfully for all of the wonderful tutorials that didn't exist over a decade ago, I was ready. I started on pen and paper and worked out mock-ups of what logic gates would look like using only treadmill tiles. I then built them in-game, wrote the proper scripts for the switches, and got them working. Finally, after hours of toiling, I was able to create an AND gate. So let me go over really quickly how this works, and that should lay the groundwork for how all of the future logic gates will work, and eventually how the half adder and all that stuff will work. So, first of all, our switches. I have these cosmetic tiles, A and B, that just tell us sort of which switch is A and which is B, though they don't have any custom code or anything. And then I have custom tiles 0 and 1, which I have made such that they push you up when you go on them, so they also act like treadmill tiles. Okay, so as you can see, we have two red tiles in the center of our gate here. So when both switches are in the up position or not pressed, that represents an input of zero. So if we have an input of zero on A and B, that means we should get zero as the result. So if we follow the tiles, we do get zero. So the result is the tile that our character, in this case May, touches. Now if I turn A on, but not B, we are still going to wind up at zero. Now, if I turn B on, but not A, I am still going to wind up at zero. So that means the only way to get the output of one is by turning both tiles with switches A and B. Thus, we get an output of one, and that is a functioning AND gate. So from here, I should be able to build all the other gates using similar logic, and then ideally build a computer. I then built an OR gate, a NOT gate, and then went ahead and made a NOR, an exclusive OR, an exclusive NOR, and a NAND. Now I finally had all my building blocks. It was time to start making my first half adder. All right, let's enter the Moss Deep City computer simulation zone, also known as the gym. Anyway, so this bottom part is the exclusive OR gate that will give us the sum of our two binary numbers. Uh, and then this second half is our AND gate, uh, which represents the carry digit of our two binary numbers. And basically all you do to use this is you put in the inputs you want, say one and one, right? So I would press this switch down and this switch down, and then you just walk into the start of the calculator to you know, give you uh, the automation on the way through. And then the tiles you step on represent the results uh, of the calculation. So here we will get our sum of one plus one, and that is of course zero, because then we have a carry digit of one. So let's see if we do get that, and indeed we do, one plus one is in fact two. So if we do say one plus zero, we should get one in the ones digit, which we do. And then instead of calling the next digit the tens digit, like we would in decimal or base 10, we'll call it the twos digit. And in the twos digit, we in fact get a zero, confirming that one plus zero is in fact one. All right, I built a half adder, let's go. I can add one plus one. I am the god of Pokemon computers, but now I wanna combine two half adders to make a full adder. But is it really that simple inside of Pokemon? The answer is no. After many hours of testing and tinkering, I wound up with the following solution for a full adder. Thank you, me from the future, for introing this. Here we go, back into Moss Deep Gym. It's a different day, I have different clothes on. It's been many hours. It's been a lot of hours. So the first thing right off the bat you'll notice in the full adder is that I have a new custom tile I made. The switch for the A input is above, and the switch for the B input is to the right. The reason for this is that switches in this game can only update tiles that are on screen. So in Gen 3 of Pokemon, tiles that are off screen are unloaded. This is an issue because 
I can't have all the tiles on screen unless I compress all the gates. So I made compressed versions of everything. So this is our same half adder from before and is the first part of our four bit full adder that I've made. Uh, except it's just really compressed. I took out all the unnecessary vanity tiles and made it much smaller. Okay, so for example, let's do addition of 1011 plus 1001. Now, if you convert both these numbers into decimal, you get 11 plus nine, which of course is equal to 20. We can do that in our heads, but the computers want to work with it in binary. So that's why our adder is so useful is because it does the addition in binary and gives us the result in binary. And the beauty of my full adder is that it shows every single step. These two switches are our first two digits. So for 1011 and 1001, those are the digits all the way on the right when you stack those addition uh, uh, numbers together. Uh, so we've got one and one, so we need to press both of these switches. Then we move on to our next digit, and this is where things get complex. Welcome to our first full adder in the four bit full adder. So the way I've designed this doesn't work exactly the same as a traditional full adder. I have created on the left side, the result when there is not a carry, and on the right side, the result when there is a carry. So on the left side, we have an exclusive OR gate. We have an exclusive NOR on the right side. Uh, so for A, we need a one, and then we need B to be a zero. Now for our third digit, uh, we've got zero, zero. And you're starting to see here why I needed the switches to be in this exact position, because I need to affect tiles that are really far away, all the way on the right side of the screen. So we've got zero, zero for our third digit there, so we don't need to do anything. And then our fourth bit, our fourth digit, we've got one and one. So here you go. This is 1011 plus 1001, the world's first four bit full adder performed completely inside of a generation three Pokemon game. Here we go. As you can see, it's kind of hard to parse in real time. I just went under the first bridge there. And there you go, and that result was 10100. It worked. I want to show you though going up onto one of the uh, the elevated platforms. So let's do another addition here. 0111 plus 0100. So here we go. So we should go up onto the second level in one of these in the third digit, I believe. There we go, we moved up. So we were on top of other tiles there, uh, which I was so happy to get working. Uh, I was really pleased that I got that functional. And again, you can extend this infinitely, meaning that this is in essence Turing complete because I have proven that every gate has some kind of corollary within Pokemon Sapphire. And if you had an infinitely large map or infinitely tall or whatever, you could theoretically create a system of logic gates that could compute anything which feels like mission accomplished to me. And that's that, a working computer inside of Pokemon Sapphire. I can add 15 plus 15 using only binary and treadmill tiles. If you wanna try your hand at making a working computer inside of Pokemon or really anything, then this video's sponsor is an excellent place to start learning about logic gates, computer science, math, and everything that goes into computation. Brilliant is an amazing platform where you learn by actually doing. There are thousands of interactive courses in math, data analysis, programming, and more. I am legitimately excited that they're sponsoring this video because it's a platform I actually enjoy. I think the biggest perk of this job where I make YouTube videos that require me to do deep research dives into super niche topics in science and math is that I actually get to learn. The best part about these lessons on Brilliant is that they are interactive, they're fun, they're engaging. You want to do them, you wanna complete them. If today's topics interested you at all, then I highly recommend jumping into Brilliant's courses on programming. Most of my programming experience is in Python, which is, in my opinion, the best language to start out with. Brilliant has tons of excellent tools for learning Python on day one with a built-in drag and drop editor that'll help you understand coding exceptionally quickly. If this interests you, go to brilliant.org slash ADEF or just click the link in the top of the description and you'll get a 30 day free trial as well as a 20% discount on a premium annual subscription if you decide to stick around. Thank you so much to Brilliant for sponsoring this video. Thank you all so much for watching. If you've watched to the end, truly thank you. Please consider subscribing. It's free and it genuinely helps. 
I'd also like to thank my top tier patrons on Patreon that you can see on the screen now. Without them, I truly could not make these videos. Coincidentally, up on my Patreon right now is a cut segment from this video in which I took scripting to the absolute limits, not worrying about custom code and just writing a completely custom script. Uh, to get a calculator working inside of one NPC's dialogue boxes in Pokemon Emerald. And I'm talking addition of decimal numbers. Yeah, I do base 10 sometimes.